with you. Let's open up to the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark first. We're going to start in Mark chapter 15. And instead of going back and forth, which I, I just think has been so much fun doing Mark and look together so we see a little more detail as we've been going along, we're going to actually just be in Mark and then we'll go to Luke. So we'll just make the one transition this evening. But we have traveled as far as now we've come to the crucifixion. The crucifixion. Jesus Christ laying down his life for your sins and my sins. It's an amazing thing. I know we hear about it so often, and probably from the time we've been a child, but without the crucifixion, there's no salvation. There's no hope. There's only hell. There's nothing. Nothing but hell. But Jesus Christ laid down his life for your sins and my sins. All right, this is week 38. Uh, Mark chapter... 15, and we'll start in verse 21 in just a few minutes. Week 38, as we've been making our way through the gospel of Luke and Mark. And last week we saw the trial of, of Pilate. I don't know whether, you, I would actually say that more Pilate was on trial more than Jesus was on trial. But I, I do want to go back and do just a couple of things in review. First of all, I want to point out that the evil men did not have their way. They did not have. The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 23, this is by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Before the world was ever created, Jesus Christ had agreed to be sacrificed on the cross of Calvary for your sins and mine. According to the book of Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, there was a divine appointment that Jesus Christ kept so that we could have our sins washed away. <clears throat> then Pilate was on trial, so he was a man that was more concerned about reputation than character. Start thinking about people you know in your own life. Hopefully you're not one of those men or women that thinks that your reputation is more important than your character. I'll say this. If you're a person of character, your reputation will take care of itself. Or even if it doesn't, Jesus said, blessed are you. When men shall revile you and persecute you, you say, all men are evil against you falsely. So even if you have the right character, your reputation may not be the right thing. But character is what's important, not reputation. Pilate also wanted to hold on to power. And I'll say this too. This is a lesson you can mark down and keep in your Bible or in your billfold or whatever. You will never keep what you compromise to gain. If you have to compromise to gain it, you will never keep it. God will not allow you to. All right, so now that in background, verse 20 says this at the end of verse 20, and they led him out to crucify him. Church, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what it's all about. But we have this strange thing that happens. And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. They compelled him. Remember when Jesus was teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, he said, if they compel you to go one mile, do what? Go two. Go the extra mile. Go, the, go two miles. So the Roman soldier could just lay that cold steel on your or iron on your shoulder and compel you to carry his backpack or his equipment or anything else one mile. That was the right of Roman soldiers to do, not just in Judea, but all across the Roman world. So they have compelled Simon of Cyrenia to bear the cross of Jesus Christ. Keep this in mind. Jesus Christ had already been beaten. In fact, let me go over this quickly with you. He's been beaten by the, by the high priest, his guards. He has been beaten by Pilate's soldiers. He has been mocked by Herod's people and by Pilate's soldiers and by the uh, high priest's servants. So he's been mocked. He's been spit upon by the high priest's servants and by Pilate's soldiers. You're starting to get a picture here. All of this he suffered from me and you. And then at last, that he beat. Not beaten, but the fist, as he was by Pilate's soldiers the first time. Or by the high priest the first time. The high priest's soldiers the first time. But, now they beat him with the whip. What people call the cat of nine tails, or what Roman historians call that. It was a Roman whip that had bone or metal into the strands. And it just would tear the flesh. Tear the flesh. And as they would hit you, they'd lay it up on... Lighten up a little if you would confess. Who was your partners in crime? Well, Jesus never said a word. He never gave up a name. 
He never said Bob was one of my partners in crime. He never said that Daniel was one of his partners because he was actually dying for your sins and my sins. But they take this sign and they put a plaque around you, uh, the Romans would, to say why you were why you were being crucified. So you'd have this placard around you, usually, of course, made out of wood. You'd be carrying a cross beam, which would weigh about 30 pounds. And you'd be carrying that. Of course, Jesus has been beaten, all the blood loss and everything. So they take this man, Simon, who is a Cyrenian, who appears in the book of Acts when it talks about the prophets there in, in this, is, now this is years later, much, much later. It talks about the prophets at Antioch. Now there were in, in the Antioch church certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simon that was called Niger, N-I-G-E-R, or, or Niger, which means black, and Lucius of Cyrene. So he's tied to this So this Simon is evidently a prophet in the church. His sons are named. Isn't that something? He carried the cross of Jesus, but not only did he do that, he carried his own cross in such a way that his sons became followers of Jesus Christ. Well known in the church, the father of Alexander and Rufus, Mark says. And then, then, then when Paul's writing to the church at Rome, he says this Rufus again, he said, and his mother, which would have been Simon's wife, and Paul said, which I consider to be my own mother. So what a family. Do you think any of this happened by chance? I'm going to tell you, he was chosen by God before the foundation of the world. That this man named Simon would carry the cross. He was called before the foundation of the world. It was no accident. He had traveled over 800 miles from Cyrene. That, that's the Libya, northern Africa. Traveled over 800 miles for probably a once in a lifetime opportunity to have the Passover in Jerusalem. Probably his family didn't travel with him. He was there alone. It's a very expensive thing. Men would do this very often, Jewish men. And there were, you say, well, he's black. Yes, but there was a large group of black Ethiopian Jews and Nigerian Jews. And there still are today, by the way. And so they, he has pledged himself. And so he's, he's traveled all the way to Jerusalem to partake in the Passover. And now he's going to meet the Passover lamb. He's going to meet what all Passovers were talking about. He's going to carry the cross for the Lamb of God. I'm sure when this first happened to him, he would have thought, why me? Why me, Lord? I'm a good guy. But something in his character caused him to go to the front of the crowd to see what was going on. The God had put that curiosity in him before he was born. And he steps to the front and the soldier puts the steel onto it or the iron onto his shoulder. And he carries a cross. And his whole life has changed. I know what you're thinking. If I'd been there, I'd have carried the cross. Would you? Would you carry the cross? The oh, funny thing is, he asked. Wouldn't have said anything, Dad. He just stood back. We stood back. I mean, because we've read the chapter. He'd never read the chapter. He didn't have this information. Nobody was volunteering to carry the cross. Not even his apostles. But here's the thing, guys. Jesus said, "Take up your cross. Follow me." You take up your cross, your cross, my cross. And evidently he did in a magnificent way and his family became believers. Is that something common? Common that, what? That they had others carry the cross for them? I, nobody said anything about it being common, but I imagine that since the Roman soldiers knew they had the right to do that, they, it was very common for them to force people to carry stuff. Now, because Jesus even mentioned in the sermon, okay? But I would imagine that it would be fairly common because a lot of men would be beaten so badly that they couldn't carry their own cross, you know. And uh, but but I don't know. None of the commentaries made any mention of that. Just that this man did it. But then I started thinking, what a blessing! What a divine! He was chosen of all of the Jewish people that were there, of all the men that were there. God chose this man, moved him 800 miles across the country, 800 miles across the desert. Or if he took a ship, he would have been about 1,200 miles, but it would be quicker going by ship. So he, God calls him. He's got something yearning in his heart. This year, wife, I believe I'm going to go to Jerusalem for the Passover. That's awfully expensive. You know, wife, I believe I'm going to go to the Passover in Jerusalem. There's already, we know in the book of Acts, a large Serenian synagogue, so there's lots of... Uh, uh, of, of, 
of Cyrenian Jews that have moved there, and they have their own synagogue along with those of Ethiopia, it says, and uh, some other from Africa, named a couple of Egypt, I remember. So they have their own synagogue, so he probably stands one of the people from there, out in the country somewhere, at just the right time. He's coming in, getting ready to go to offer his lamb. Now his life has been changed forever. But will we carry our cross? That's the question for us. Will we carry our cross as he, as he tells us to? Well, okay, that's enough about Simon. But, but be thinking about the question, will we carry our cross? Now, and they bring him unto the place called Golgotha, which you may not know what that means, so Mark tells us which is being interpreted the place of the skull. Luke uses the Greek word, or I should say the Latin word, translated into Greek and then in English, and we know that word, don't we? It is Calvary. <laughs> you want to freak some of your neighbors out, say, look, you ought to come down to our church. Where you go to church? We go to School Baptist Church. Because that's what Calvary means. It means the cranium, the school, the place of the school. So I kind of freak them out. I said, come down. We got, we got school. Sunday school, we got school, BYF, we got school. You know, you just play it up big, okay? They'll say, man, you must go some kind of cold or something. But this is no beauty. We, we romanticize the cross. We romanticize Golgotha and, and Calvary. But the truth of the matter is, it was a place of execution. And I made a couple of little notes here. Uh, the pictures that Sister Maul showed here at our church years ago, twenty. 6, 25, 26 years ago where she and her husband I never knew her husband, he had passed before I came here to pastor, they had went to the Holy Land years and years ago and she showed us the pictures that she made and you could see what they call Gordon's Calvary the the shape of a skull where that they, where the Romans have built a road at the highest place of the, at the highest place of the mountain on Mount Moriah where Abraham had offered Isaac the highest place there and the rocks as they'd worked and dug and it actually looks like a skull. Now, I'm going to disappoint you if you go today because maybe there's this nasty bus terminal in front of it built by some Muslims. And then they put a Muslim graveyard on top of Calvary, on top of Christ. It's filthy. Why that that's allowed to happen, I'll never know. So, But if you could get through the diesel smell and you could stand there Inside the bus terminal, looking out through the barbed wire, I mean through the uh, chain link fence, you'll see Calvary. You'll see it there. You'll still see the shape. You'll say, my, this, the most holy place on earth. Jesus shed his blood for your sins and for my sins. On Calvary. On Calvary. He was crucified. There's not much detail. In fact, if you put all four of the Gospels together, you don't have about 15 words. They say this. And they bring him to the place, unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of the skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, that is, uh, uh, an anesthesia that helps with some of the pain. But he received it not. And here we have it. This is it. I underlined it in my Bible. And when they had crucified him, that's it. You read the Gospel of John. And when they had crucified him, read the Gospel of Luke, which we will this evening. And they crucified him. We don't have the details, what did it look like. We know that he was pierced through his hands and his feet. We know that from the book of Isaiah. We know that because he says to them, Behold my hands, which, which means that from your elbows down, doesn't mean right in his hands. It can be the wrist, any part of the arm below your elbow. They nailed him to the tree. There he laid down his life for you and for me. Oh, Calvary. <laughs> the Calvary. It's not how much details about it. It's the very fact that he died as a sacrifice for your sins and my sins. And they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And so this again fulfills prophecy. This fulfills a prophecy that they would gamble for his, for his garments. In the book of uh, Psalm, Psalm 22. So, Actually, find out that there's only one piece of clothing that he has that has any value. There's just one seamless robe that he has. And probably the robe put on him by Herod's men when they put on him that glistening robe. Remember, I love how Luke described it. It was a glistening robe. And it, uh, 
Gorgeous. That's what Luke says. A gorgeous robe that he puts on. And so the uh, only thing of any value that he had was given to him. So let me take time for it. If somebody would like to make a comment on this, this is, this is the Holy of Holies. This is Calvary. Let's keep going then. And it was the third hour. That's 9 a.m. So think about this. All of this has been, all these trials, these six trials that he's had have been for probably about two in the morning when they arrest him in, in, uh, in Gethsemane until probably around 8, 15, 8, 30 or so. Then they beat him one more time and they send him to Calvary to die. Ninth hour, or excuse me, third hour, 9 a.m., they crucified him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. Now that's a, that's a good story in that. Because uh, <laughs> the, 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 the others said, uh, the, if you put all the gospels together, what you find out is it says this. Let me find my notes here. This is Jesus. See, let me read it to you. This is Jesus the Christ, the king, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. So each one of them tells us a little part about this right here. So he is brought there. He is crucified. And he has this inscription up over top of him that this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. The, the, by the way, the Jewish leaders said, don't put this. You remember what they said? Put, he says he is king of the Jews. Pilate refused though. Pilate said, no, I've written. What I've written. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Wow. So Mark has a part of it recorded here for us. The King of the Jews, which is definitely the important part. Jesus, the King of the Jews. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Okay. So, and with him were crucified two thieves, one on his right hand and the other on his left, both equally there, I don't know if they measured off the distance, but they both are close enough where Jesus can hear them casting uh, insults at him, uh, derisions at him. And the scripture was fulfilled. This sounds like the Gospel of Matthew, which said, and he was numbered with the transgressors. So he lists that from the book of Isaiah. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, oh, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days. Again, you find this in Psalm 22. Let me just take a little time out here. Let me have everybody's attention just for a minute here now. If you want to see the Father's view of, of, the, of, of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, go to Genesis chapter 22. There you'll read what Abraham, where he takes Isaac up to the mountain. You'll see God, the Father's point of view. If you want to see God, the Son's point of view, go to Psalm 22. There you'll see it starts out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You say, well, I thought that was here. It is. But that whole psalm is a crucifixion psalm. It talks about one thing and the next thing. And all these things that come against him, how they wag their heads, how that he said that the, that the bulls of Bashan came against him in the darkness. Church, I don't even know if we can even begin to imagine what Christ suffered. As he hung, I, I don't think I know we can't. We can't imagine what he suffered on the cross of Calvary. Physically, somebody may be able to repeat it, but nobody else was ever one hundred percent innocent to bear. If 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 you die, you'll die maybe as a martyr, but you can never die in someone else's place. But Jesus Christ dies on the cross of Calvary for your sins and for my sins. If you want to see the spirits, the Holy Spirit's point of the, of the crucifixion or a view of the crucifixion, then I say do this. Go to Isaiah 53. Go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> Go to the four Gospels and you can read them all. You can read Isaiah 53 and all, all four crucifixion accounts in less than 20 minutes. You can see what the Holy Spirit is saying. It's a good thing to do. Sit down with your Bible. Get a cup of coffee tomorrow morning. Sit down and just open up and say, Lord, speak to me this morning. Read Isaiah 53 and then read Matthew's account, and Mark's account, and Luke's account, and John's account. Seriously, it's just a little bit to read. 
you'll say, wow, this is what Jesus Christ did for you and for me. Save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise, also the priests mocking said among themselves with the scribes, he saved others, himself he cannot save. What, why are these men not going and getting ready for the Passover with their families? Why are they still, they, they hate Jesus so desperately that they go to, to the side of the crucifixion so that they can slam him and, 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 and malign him and, and say all men are against him, mocking him, as it says in, in Mark, and the chief priest mocking him. Let Christ, the King of Israel, which is what was written over his head, to sin now from the cross that we may see and believe. They would not have believed. They would not have believed. If they were wanting to believe, they would have believed already. If they would have believed when they saw Jesus raise the dead, when they saw Jesus open the blinded eyes, all these things fulfilled uh, from, the, from other passages, Isaiah chapter uh, 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, other places where it talks about what the Messiah will do. They knew. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land till the ninth hour. So at noon, from noon until three, darkness covered the face of the entire earth. Luke tells us it's the entire earth, not just part of the land. Mark tells us the part that he knows about there in the land. But Luke writes later, and evidently it's up, because we have Roman records of this. We have, Ethiopia. We have excuse me, uh, records from Alexandria, that in 32 A.D. there was a darkening of the sun that no one could explain. Could not be a could not be an eclipse because this was a full moon. You can't have an eclipse when there's a full moon if the moon's in the wrong place. Somebody said, "Well, maybe it was a dust storm." Yeah, a dust storm that covered the whole earth. You know, no, God darkened. That, look what it says here: darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Everything stopped. It's not like they can get out their cell phone and, or, or a lighter in their pocket, is it? And you don't have torches with you in the middle of the day, do you? There was darkness and stumbling around. The Bible says, and I just made a couple of notes here, that the darkness in the, in the land of Egypt for three days, now this is three hours before the death of the, the, the Passover lamb, but for three days, the, the ninth plague is the darkness. It says it was so darkness that they gnawed their tongues for pain. The book of Revelation. Let me find my reference here. Chapter 16, verse 10. says there will be a darkness that covers all the earth during the tribulation time. And it says this again. They will gnaw their tongues. Men will chew on their tongues because the darkness is so terrifying. So here they are in the middle of the day. High noon. In March. So it's a beautiful spring day and and, and bright, and all of a sudden, there's darkness. God dimmed the sun. Because I looked up the word darkness in all these places, the Greek word, and it mean, it did not mean to, uh, to hide. It meant to darken. So God just caused the sun not to shine. And men could not see. I guess somebody stumbled around. They found something. They light up something eventually. And for those three hours, Christ doesn't say anything on the cross. He makes seven statements from the cross. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But for these three hours, he says nothing. In these three hours, he is separated from God. And he'll break the silence. Let's read. In the ninth hour, when the darkness is broke, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani which being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus will say seven statements from the cross. The first one, he'll call him Father. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We'll see that in the Gospel of Luke this evening. He says it, it's in, it's in, an, in the imperfect tense. It means he says it over and over. As they were, as they were leading him there, they were mocking him. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. As they nailed. Can you imagine these men beside of him? Struggling, fighting with for everything in them. And they, they hold their arms down. That's why they bring such a large group of Roman soldiers. 
They take that large spike and they drive through his wrist or his hand. wrist actually is worth what they did. They drive through that and then the next guy when they come to him he's screaming even harder fighting and here is Jesus. It says he opened not his mouth. He laid there. Now, don't you think that he did not have pain? That's not what he wanted to avoid. That's not what he prayed. If this cup is possible, let this cup pass. There have been many martyrs in the church. Some that have been burned alive. Some that have been beheaded. Some that have been skinned alive. All these terrible. Jesus did not take any of the any of the of the of the, of the murder of the, of the of the of the anesthesia because he wanted to be in full control of his faculties. But he opened not his mouth. What an amazement this must have been to the Roman soldiers. What an amazement it must have been to the men being crucified with him, to the crowd even. And here's what he says as they're doing all this. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then the seventh statement, he says to the Father again, he says, Father, in thy hands I commend my spirit. All right, a little Bible quiz here. Man, I wish Uncle Jim was here. They could help us out here. So let's listen, guys. All right, are you ready? Are you ready? How many of the seven statements are in all the Gospels? None. Okay. How many of the seven, which Gospel, all right, let's ask this question. Maybe it's just seven. Are any of the seven statements in more than one Gospel? Okay. Cheryl thinks yes. Huh? Jim Matthew and Mark. Okay. okay. Now, which statement? My, my God, my God. Well, that's right. That's the only one of the seven statements that's in all the other Gospels only have one or two or three. But if Luke says it, Matthew doesn't say it. If, if John says it, Mark doesn't say it. Every statement is recorded by a different person except for my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me is recorded by Matthew and by Mark. It's the only one of the statements that is in more than one Gospel. That's kind of amazing, isn't it? You'd think they all would have been writing down everything that he said. But it's seven statements. The only one that's in more than one gospel is, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So I want to give you a picture of all of them, okay? He starts out by saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke says that. Luke also said to the, we'll read this in a little while. He says to the thief, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Hallelujah. What a, what a statement. John says the third statement, has the third statement put in order for us. And he says, woman, behold thy son. Talking about John the Apostle, who by now would have been about 19, maybe 20. He was the, one, of the, one of the two apostles that were just young teenagers when they started following the Lord. James would have been an older teenager, but they, Jesus had at least three teens in his group. as he's, He chose 12 people in all the world and three of them were teenagers. So don't let people put down teenagers, okay? Jesus chose them. And John is, is maybe now 19, maybe 20 years old. And he says, Behold, woman, behold thy son. Because his brothers were, were not believers yet. And then he says to John, Behold thy mother. John records that. And then Matthew and Mark record, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then very quickly, in the next few minutes, Christ dies. He says, I thirst. That's in the Gospel of John. He said, It is finished. That is in the Gospel of John. And then Luke said, records the last one, Father, in thy hands, I command my spirit. Jesus, what a Savior. I hope tonight you leave here saying, hope you don't just leave saying, oh, let's talk about the weather. Talk. hope tonight you think about this when you go to bed. I hope you think about this tomorrow. Jesus died in your place. Daniel, you think that uh, God forgave him when Jesus said that? Oh, all right, Brother Mike. So there's my question. Let's wait till we get to Luke to answer it, okay? All right. So, because that is, that's great, Brother Mike. That's a great question. The central cry of all of humanity is this. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Everything in the world can be measured before that cry and after that cry. Because the then, as it comes out of the darkness, Jesus has given his life for the sins of all the world. He has suffered all the attacks of Satan. He has paid for all of our sins there in the darkness. In the next few minutes, he will give his life. He will die. He will say, I thirst. 
so he can shout out what he's going to say. They give him that to drink, vinegar, not vinegar mixed with, with myrrh, but just a vinegar, common drink of the soldiers. Be like a, a, a watered wine the soldiers would have there, there close by them. And it's because it says that his tongue cleaved to his mouth. So, in fact, when he says this, my God, my God, was forsaken me, they actually, look, let's read on. And some of them which stood by when they heard it said, 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 Behold, he calleth for Elijah. <laughs> and one, one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar. Psalm 69, verse 21. And put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Let alone, let's see whether Elijah will come and take him down. But we know that he did this in response to Christ saying, I thirst. But Christ wants to shout out his last two statements. He's going to say it is finished. That's it. Father, in thy hands I commend my spirit. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Jesus cried with a loud voice. Mark tells us. Mark doesn't tell us what he said. Uh, John and Luke tell us that. Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in two from top to the bottom. Wow. Saying we no longer need a priest. Uh, let, me, let me back up just a little bit more, say a couple more things about this. This says not only the center statement of the seven, it is a center statement of all of the world. Everything's measured before this statement and after this statement. When Jesus Christ gives his life for our sins. But it's also, I made a little note at the top of my Bible, we as Christians will never have to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because why? Our favorite Bible verse, I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. He forsook his son so that we will never be forsaken. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, so, in the veil of the temple, which will be about 70 feet high, this great temple of Herod's, uh, the, the, the veil would be a hand's breadth. Now, I know what a hand span is when you're measuring horses. That's about nine inches. But a hand's breadth, people say it's probably five to six inches. So I'll take another people's word for it. Would have been that thick. I know that they would, according to Jewish uh, heritage uh, history, they would take and put an oxen on each side and try to see if they could pull this curtain apart. And that way, if they didn't, they knew it was worthy to be hung in the temple. Of course, they didn't change it very often, you can imagine, throughout the hundreds of years. But God tears it, and I love this, from the top to the bottom. God does this. God tears it from the top to the bottom. And this is the time when it happened. In the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, time for the evening sacrifice. Oh, I know they've been killing tens of thousands. Tens of thousands of sheep have been killed, lambs have been killed for the Passover. But now it's time for the evening sacrifice, so priests would have been all in there. I love it says in the, God, in the book of Acts that many priests became believers after his resurrection. Can you? What would you think? If there you were and you saw something, talk about, you, you, if you saw somebody tearing a big thick phone book in half, you'd be impressed. I see strong men do that sometimes. They'll do it impressed. But God tears this curtain. And they, for the first time in their life, they've never even seen this. Though they may have been priests at 70 years old, they've never seen the Holy of Holies. They look and they see the Holy of Holies, the mercy seat where the blood is applied. And no doubt scrambling out, we find out there was a great earthquake at this time also. And they believe. Many of them believe. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he, uh, saw that, that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly... This man is the son of God. Wow, what a confession. I hope that he became a, a believer. It seems that he has. Then our last verses here in Mark. There were also women looking on afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less, one of his apostles, and Joseph and Salome. That would have been the mother of James and John. Huh. Who also, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered to him and many other women which came up with them unto Jerusalem. And uh, I always like to point this out when I get a chance. Faithful women. Faithful women. What an opportunity to say this. 
They are the last at the cross and the first at the tomb. <laughs> women, faithful women, last at the cross, first at the tomb. Jesus has exalted. I know that the Jewish religion did not put down women like other religions that that day did or even religions of today do, like Islam does. But the Jewish religion has exalted women, but not like Christianity. Because what does the whole New Testament tell us? There's no difference between male and female. Jesus Christ saves everyone equally. Equally saves us all. Anybody that will believe can be saved. A woman doesn't have to wait for her husband to be saved to be part of this. A woman can be saved. A man can be saved. God put us all on equal grounds. And when he tore that, tent, that, that, that veil in half, no more need for a priest. Now see, my gift here at the church is to teach the word of God. And to be part of shepherding the flock, to help lead the flock. But I don't have any closer connection to God than any one of you do. Uh, you could come and ask me a question. Uh, should I be sleeping and having sex with my boyfriend? I can help you with that one. Not in the book. No. You come and ask me, should we move to Princeton? I don't know. I'm not picking on you. Uh, Cliff, okay, okay. Uh, uh, should we? No, that's. I have no direct line. I can help you pray about it, but you have as much authority with God as anyone else does. You, being a deacon doesn't give you authority with God. Being a Sunday school teacher doesn't give you authority with God. Being a pastor doesn't give you authority with God. You have your own right to talk directly to God. We can come boldly before the throne of grace because Jesus Christ is our high priest. Hallelujah. That's what this is about. That's what this is about. Now turn with me over now to the Gospel of Luke. We'll see some of the same things again. But we're also going to see some things that we haven't seen before. Luke chapter 23. And let's see where we start. Verse 26, where we stopped that last week. Pilate has agreed to have him crucified. And Luke starts with the same story. And as they led him away... They laid hold upon Simon. Luke, uh, Mark says they compelled him. Same thing. They would, he would have no choice. A Cyrenian uh, from North Africa coming out of the country because there's no room in the city. And they laid on and they laid the cross. They laid on him, and on him they laid the cross that he might that he might bear it after Jesus. Now, there's an old story. I don't know if this is true or not. But there's an old story in Protestant churches and in Catholic churches that as Simon is carrying the cross, that heavy cross made, that Jesus laid his hand on Simon. <laughs> and the story goes that he never felt the weight of the cross, <laughs> that he only felt the touch of the Master. <clears throat> now, I don't know if that's a true story or not, but you listen to me right now. I know a lot of times in my life, when I've been carrying the cross that has been assigned to me because each one of us have our own cross, I felt the touch of the Master. I felt it. And you have too, haven't you? When the doctors say there's no hope. When your family seems like it's falling apart. When life has come against you in so many different ways that you really got to go back to think about this. He tells us to bear a cross, but then he says, I'll not put anything on you that you cannot bear. So, I don't know if that story is true or not. It's a cool story. But I know this. Many times I've felt his hand on my shoulder. It's encouraged me to keep going, to go that extra mile, to keep moving, to keep doing what was right. I just made another note here in Luke that he travels 800 miles from Africa and he meets the Lamb of God. And then I got this from Dr. Wearsby earlier, I guess back in 2006 when I taught this the last time here at Calvary. He traded religion and devotion for reality and salvation. <laughs> religion, regelion, means to reconnect. God doesn't want us to reconnect. What are we going to reconnect to? God doesn't want us to have religion. He wants us to have a relationship. He wants us to have a reality. Re worlds have religion. All the world has some kind of religion. Well, I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about knowing Jesus. Being saved by His blood. Having a, having a lie. So now Luke's going to have something that's only in Luke. Matthew doesn't have this. John doesn't have this. Mark doesn't have this. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. They truly loved him. You can see this. 
And Jesus turning unto them said, so he took time. Now remember now, his mouth has already been busted the very first thing in the very first trial. He's been beaten with a rod on his face. He's had a, mass, a blindfold put over him, beaten with fist. He's got a crown of thorns shoved on his head. He's been spit on by hundreds and hundreds of people. All these things going on because it said they got the whole band. We know that not the whole 500 show up, but at least a couple of hundred came. They all spit on him. They all mocked him. But he takes time to turn and say something kind to these women. Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Hmm. Why? For behold, the days are coming in the which they, sh they shall say, Blessed are the barren. That was a curse in Israel for a woman not to have a child because every Jewish woman wanted to have a child and to be part of bringing the Messiah into the world. Blessed are the barren, the wombs that never, never bear, the paps which never gave suck. And they shall begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and the hills, cover us. They'll cry this out in less than one generation. Many of the people here this day in A.D. 32 were there in A.D. 70. When the, when the, when the Romans started the, the siege was four days before Passover, so there were over a million people crammed into the little city of Jerusalem, which there would have been on Jesus' day too. So the city has grown from 60, 80,000 to over a million. Most of the time, to, if you count the number of lambs, time 10, then would be closer to 2 million. But we know that over a million Jews are going to die in that siege. That goes on for, I wrote down the number of days if I can find it here. 100, uh, 100, between 115 and 120 days, from April the 14th until August the 9th in AD 70, Four days before the Passover, they started this siege. It got so bad that they started casting dead bodies over the wall. And Titus, the general, who later would become Caesar, the Titus actually recorded in the Roman records, in the military records, he said, God, now he's not talking to Jehovah God, just God, his gods, gods. God have mercy on me. I never intended this. They would not surrender. They would not surrender. They were eating their own children. They were eating their own husbands, their own wives. Starvation was everywhere. There was no water left in the city. And so he says, if they'll do this, for if they do these things in a green tree, an innocent man, what shall be done in the dry? So weep for yourself, daughters of Jerusalem, because the day is coming when you would rather the, the mountains fall on you. And to suffer through this. 97,000 Jews that are healthy enough will be taken into captivity in Rome and over a million will die. That's hard for us to understand, isn't it? Over a million will die. All right, so let's keep going here. And there were also two other malefactors led with them to be put to death. Isaiah 53 again. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, that's like the name of our church, Calvary, the place of the school, Cranium. There they crucified him. That's all. That that's it. There's there's March. I mean, Luke's whole thing. There they crucified him. I mean, not the details about it. How how they laid him down. How many times they hit him. How the hammers looked. I'm not just they crucified him. Uh, the important part is that he was crucified. And the malefactors, one on the right hand, the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They parted his raiment and cast lots, as I said, for the seamless robe. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's a good question, Brother Mike. He kept saying it, by the way. He kept saying it. it, it, it it's in that, it's in that uh, uh, aorist tense. That, I mean, not the aorist tense. It's in the tense where it just, imperfect tense, where it just keeps he, So he said it. He said it as they were nailing him. He said it as they're hanging up. He says it as they're cursing at him. He keeps saying, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. So here's the question, Brother Mike. Is it a prayer that is answered? Let's put it this way. If, it's, if, if God doesn't answer this prayer, it will be the only prayer he never answered for Jesus, right? So we got two choices. You can say God didn't answer this prayer, or God did answer the prayer. And, and, and I certainly believe that God did answer the prayer, so let me explain. Some people try to change this and say, 
this was a prayer that, that forgiveness would be provided. Well, of course the forgiveness would be provided. That's not what Jesus is praying. He's what He's doing. He's providing the forgiveness for people. That's not what He's praying. That's, that's a, that's, that's, if you read most commentaries, that's what they tell you. He was pra praying for providing the way. That's not at all. That's definitely not what happened here. Okay? But no, we do know that God's will is not always done, right? Because it says it's not His will that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And we know there are millions of people that turn their back on Jesus. But is this, is this prayer answered? All right. So, that these men would be redeemed and come to faith would not surprise me to meet these people in heaven. That's certainly, that's not what I think happens exactly here. But I wouldn't be surprised when Jesus prayed for them to be forgiven that it didn't, the Holy Spirit didn't speak to these people's hearts down through the years until they came to know Christ the Savior. But I don't know that. Here's what I do know. I believe with all of my heart that God forgave this particular sin because Jesus Christ was paying for all sin. I believe that if they did not come to know Christ the Savior, Brother Mike, that when they stand before God someday, I truly hope that the commentaries that say they, they finally would came, to, came to belief that, 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 that the Holy Spirit spoke to them until they were saying, I don't know, there's no, there's no record like of that saying that. But now they may have, and I wouldn't all, all be surprised to meet them in heaven and say, they would say, I was one of those that crucified him. I was one of those that showed the spirit in his side. I was the centurion, which I do think came to faith. Uh, I was one that spit on him. And all. I, I don't know. But here's what I do believe. Jesus Christ prayed to the Father. Don't hold this against them. He prayed it over and over and over. So even if they didn't get saved, I believe that someday when they stand before God, this sin will not be recorded against them. So, Brother Mike, I believe that he answered this prayer. I think that he answered this prayer, Brother Mike. Not in the sense that they were automatically forgiven because people have to repent to be forgiven. But I really hope that, 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 that many of them did repent. I really hope so. I don't have any proof of that. But I do believe that God answered his prayer because he answered all. Hey, what did he say? He said, I say nothing unless the Father saith. I go nowhere except the Father says. So everything that he prayed was according to the Father's will. So when he prayed this, I truly believe that this particular sin was not held against any of the, the mocking, the, the, the thief that doesn't come to believe, all the sins he'll have to pay for in hell. I don't think this will be one of the sins he'll pay for is for mocking Jesus. He, Jesus prayed for him to be forgiven of that. He'll remember through eternity how close he was to the Savior. And he didn't believe. But that's what I think, Mike, about that question. And uh, I know I shared it in about four minutes, but it took me about 30 minutes last night to write all this down to come back and forth, back and forth. But this is what I believe. And, I, and by the way, when I did this, this breaks no theological laws. Believing that God did not lay this one sin to their charge does not break any laws. They will still be held accountable for their other sins. It only enhances God's grace to mankind, in my opinion. All right, so. All right, so. And the people have stood beholding, and the rulers with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. Of course, everything's going to change when the darkness comes, isn't it? There's going to be a silence. And the superscription also was written over him in, in, in letters in Greek and Latin and Hebrew. Now, 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 Mark didn't tell us this. It's written in three languages. Greek, the language of commerce, the language of common people. Like today, the language of commerce is English. Okay, so the, now the Romans were in charge, not the Greeks, but the Greek world had been so taken over with the Greek language, calling on Greek, common Greek. So he writes it in the Greek language, language of commerce. He writes it in Latin, that is the official language of Rome. So this is the governmental language, and then he writes it in Hebrew, the religious language. This is the King of the Jews. So in all these languages, and again, Pilate, the Jews come to Pilate and say, do not write this. Right, he says he is, but, he's, but no, Pilate would not have it changed. And one of the malefactors were hanged, uh, were hanged railed on him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other, 
Now remember, they both could talk to him. But the other answered and rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God? Seeing thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly. So he done the one. What's he do? He confesses his sins. We deserve this. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And then he prays for forgiveness. And he said to him, Lord, remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom. Lord, we know he believed something. Listen to me. Something in the kindness of his voice. Something in the way he handled the crucifixion. Something that maybe this man had heard Jesus preach before. I don't know. But he believes. This bothers people. Can you imagine him when he stands before God someday and God blesses him and says, here's your reward. And he says, I only believed a few minutes before I died. <laughs> I didn't do nothing. And God says, look behind you, son. <laughs> you see those thousands and thousands of people that believed on their deathbed? Because this story was preached to them? Do you know how many people have read this story and accepted Christ as Savior in prison? Thousands and thousands, tens of thousands through the years have accepted Christ because of this man's testimony. So don't think he did nothing. He believed. And what does God, Jesus say? Jesus gives him assurance of salvation. Cracks me up because simply he didn't know the four spiritual laws. He didn't know Roman drove to salvation. He wasn't baptized. That's a big one in our, in our part of the country. He didn't have this and that done. Tell you what. We talk about religion. We talk about relationship. And even this man, this criminal, this, this man that was part of a murdering gang, he believed. He believed. And Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, Today, Shalt thou be with me in paradise? By the way, if you want to know where Jesus went when he died, he didn't go to some underground place. He didn't go to uh, uh, to Hades, all that foolishness that, that the Catholic Church has been teaching since the, about 250 B.C. A.D. None of that foolishness is true. I even though I know that Moody Bible Institute teaches them to lots of Baptists, Pentecostals have been pushing for the last 70 or 80 years. No, no, no. When Jesus died, he went to God. And when you die... <laughs> Hallelujah! You'll go to God. When he died, he didn't. Don't, don't you guess about where he went. He says, Father, in thy hands I commend my spirit. He tells us where he went. He went to be with God. He went to be with God. That's where he went. And he says this man, today, not, not a month from now, not three days from now, today, you'll be in paradise yet. But no, he said, with me. I'll be there with you, son. We'll be together. We'll be in heaven together. It was about the sixth hour and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened. Just, just did not shine. The bell of the temple was ringing in the mist. Let me see if I've got any more additional notes to add to this. Okay. All right. No. The sun was darkened. And the bell of the temple was ringing in the mist. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, in thy hands I commend my spirit. And having thus said, he gave up the ghost. He had already told them, hadn't he? No man can take my life from me. Nobody can kill Jesus. He's God. I know he's man, but he's also God. And, and he's so God that he doesn't seem to be man. He's so man he doesn't seem to be God, but he's both. Now, I'm not, he's not a mixture. Don't start that crazy doctrine, okay? He's God. And he's man. And he died in our place to wash our sins away. He died to pay the price to God in the three hours of darkness. He paid an eternal price. Because you know what hell is? I mean, you know what the lake of fire is? Eternal darkness. Eternal darkness. Even hell, where people right now will be cast into the lake of fire, the great white throne judgment. Even death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. Now when the centurion saw this was done, what's it say? He glorified God. That's why I really believe this man became a believer. Saying certainly this was a righteous man. That's one response. We're going to see three responses to this. That's one response right there. That uh, he certainly is a righteous man. Then there are the others. And all the people that came together to the sight, the sightseers. Behold, the things which were done smote their breast and returned. So the second group was affected. They're emotionally affected. They're beating their breast. How can they do a Jewish brother like this? You know, 
We, we get outraged in our country if someone mistreats one of our American soldiers, don't we? I mean, we, we're all in arms about it. They smoke their breast and return. Then there's a third group. And all his acquaintance, and here's those women again, followed him from Galilee, stood afar off, beholding these things, always faithful, always faithful. Hallelujah. Now, Dr. Uh, Warren Wiersbe, and I know some of y'all, several of y'all have his commentary. He makes a comment on this little phrase right here. Father, in thy hands I commend my spirit. According to Dr. Wiersbe, that's a pretty common at that time, and still a common Jewish prayer today for Jewish children when they go to bed. They pray, Father, in thy hands I commend my spirit. Now, I don't have the education that, that Dr. Wiersbe had, certainly, so I'm going to take his word for it. If that's true, I should say since that's true, since Dr. Wiersbe said that, that that's a common phrase still among Jewish people today, then I'll say this. He was bowing his head and going home. But I'm going to tell you something that I dug up myself. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you remember a few months before this when they one of them saw me said, I'll follow you anywhere. And he said, well, the foxes have holes. The birds have nests. But the Son of Man what? He don't have nowhere to lay his head. The word lay there <laughs> is the same Greek word that when it says that uh, and he bowed, well, Mark, that we said that, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. This bowing of the head, same word. <coughs> he finally had a place to lay his head. He's going home to be with his daddy. He's going home to be with the spirit. What a thing. What a thing. And we'll never be forsaken. All right. At this time, we're going to end our, our uh, Facebook Live, and we certainly appreciate you spending part of your Wednesday evening with us this evening. And we're going to take time for questions and comments. Thank you.